Hello all. Hello, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for joining us for our panel discussion, educating future data workers about ethics and bias. I am Andreen Soli. I'm the director of the Public Interest Technology University Network, PIT UN for short. Uh, the network is currently comprised of 36 colleges and universities who have committed to helping us build out the field of public interest technology within academia. Practically, that means we wanna help students and faculty do the following create interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary curricula that allow students to assess the ethical, political, and social dimensions of new technology, as well as help students to develop the skills and knowledge they need to create and design technologies that serve the public and generate public benefit. Second, we are thinking we want to develop experiential learning opportunities such as clinics, internships, externships that highlight how students or faculty can pursue PIT across all sectors. We strive to answer the question, what are the career pathways that are available in PIT? And third, we uh, seek to support and recognize faculty for doing research and teaching within PIT as part of their tenure process. We wanna ensure that PIT is not a disqualifier for faculty members who choose to engage in this work. And finally, we also hope to evaluate and share stories of best practices of PIT with each other, as well as with the broader PIT ecosystem. This is perfectly a perfect example of the fourth goal for us, really, is this, this conversation. Um, membership in the network is open to any nonprofit educa educational institution within the US each fall. You can find our application at uh, newamerica.org slash PITUN. Uh, each fall, um, you'll see a new application posted there. Now I just want to get us excited, get us started. I'm very excited about this conversation. I want to introduce you to our panelists, all members of Pit UN, and they are going to talk to us about what they see the, as the intersection of their work with Pit, within Pit, in terms of ethics, bias, and open data. First up is Meredith Broussard, a data professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at New York University and research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. Second, we have Kathleen Kamiski, professor in the psychology department and women and gender sexuality studies program at CUNY Staten Island. Here from this point forward, I'll be calling her Katie. Meher Scherziger, who runs, who runs Princeton Interdisciplinary Technology Policy Clinic at its Center for Information Technology Policy. Hello, Meher. And Mona Sloan, adjunct professor at New York University's Tandon School of Engineering and C senior research scientist at the NYU Center for Responsible AI. As a reminder, I wanna let you know that we are live tweeting this via New America Pit. And so please be sure to follow us at New America Pit, which will be in the chat directly. First, let's get a bit, let's get a sense of the big picture everyone. Uh, this is a question for um, each of y'all. And I will start with, um, we'll start with Meredith and then we'll go around. Social scientists have been studying the historical, political, economic, and ethical dimensions of technological tools for a very long time. What are some of the concrete ways that you have been engaging students in seeing the impact or disparate outcomes of existing technologies or new ones on people? How do you help students understand and anticipate the risks associated with technology? And Meredith, oh, so let's start with you. Sure, this is a good question. Uh, one of the things that I teach is data journalism, uh, which is the practice of finding stories and numbers and using numbers to tell stories. And so given the traditional function of the press as, uh, as an accountability uh, monitor, it's a uh, it's very easy to lead students from uh, journalistic skepticism to the, uh, the kind of inquiry that Pitt requires. Uh, one of the things that journalists tell each other is that if your mother says she loves you, check it out, <laughs> right? So uh, we need to be skeptical about claims that are made about technology. Technology is not automatically for the public good. Uh, one of the things that Ruha Benjamin writes is that we should assume that technology discriminates by default, right? There is bias in the world, there is discrimination in the world, and all AI systems do is they reflect and magnify the world as it is. So if we use the idea as a default that the technology is discriminating by default, it allows us to uh, more accurately 
pinpoint exactly why technology is going wrong, uh, who it is biased against, who the technology is not serving, and then that allows us to remediate those issues if it's possible. Thanks, Mona. How about you? How do you get that get that across fairly quickly to your students? Thanks, Andrine, and it's just a pleasure to be on this panel with everybody. I'm very happy to be here. So um, quickly, not at all. I think that's <laughs> a very, <laughs> yep. it's a very long process and it's, um, it's an ongoing conversation. So one of the things that um, I like to do with my students in the different classes that I teach on the topic is get them to think about the kinds of assumptions that get baked into the technology. So just, you know, uh, being cued in by what Meredith said and what Rua writes about, um, assuming that there's discrimination and then we can look at what that specifically looks like with different kinds of technologies, different kinds of domains uh, and in different kinds of, um, you know, spaces. I think though that it's, it's really important for students to get to a place where they can really tease out the good and the bad assumptions, right? We very often talk about implicit bias that gets baked in and, uh, you know, it wasn't our intention. That's actually a language we also find in, in policy a, a fair bit. And so getting them to a point where they're able to identify what kinds of uh, assumptions get baked into technology is key. And so the way I do that as a social scientist who teaches at an engineering school is, you know, very kind of traditional like reading of social science scholarship, but also very much engaging with the very vibrant scholarship that we are seeing on the topic that has, you know, emerged um, over the past 10 years, but like has become really, really um, prominent over, I'd say the last three years. And so I think that's, that is very important. The other thing that what I really like to do is get them to a place where they can relate this to their own lived experience. Um, we always talk about intersectionality um, in the tech discourse and, and at this point also in policy and in, in, in popular media. And what that really means is looking at the lived experience of the individual as it relates to different social macro structures and getting them to a point where they can do that for themselves when they look at different kinds of technologies and their applications. And most importantly, being able to sit with the tension that comes with that, that you know, with the acknowledgement that there is no easy answer often to these kinds of really thorny problems is what we're trying to do in these classes. Thanks, um, Katie, and then Mehera, and then I really wanna get back to the idea of um, what does it mean to start with the premise that um, bias is already built in? I'd love to come back around to that. I could go for that one. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I was just thinking about, so, so for my pit project, I'm at the College of Staten Island, as Andrine uh, mentioned, which is part of the City University of New York, and my work is centered at um, an extension of our main campus, which is located on the north shore of Staten Island, that was built in, with an intention of um, fulfilling our mission of equity and access to higher ed for Staten Islanders. Um, and I've recruited a cohort of students right out of high, four area high schools um, into uh, CSI, and they're taking their gen ed courses um, in their first year, the majority of them having a focus on PIT. So I'm working closely with the faculty who typically teach English composition and a civics course and Art 100 and a, um, a, um, a media literacy class and, and an ethics course um, all in their first year that have a focus on how, however we're coming to define what public interest tech is. And, and we're co-creating it. We're co-creating it, the meaning behind this with our students. I myself is, are, isn't, have worked and um, published um, in the field of mobile communication studies around as a social psychologist around how mobile devices and mobile media impact um, interpersonal and social relationships. And, um, you know, I think where we're headed in, in, this, in this discussion, but also in how our program is evolving at the college is thinking about the role that, um, that students play or whether how students in, in, in general or users in general can maintain a certain degree of autonomy and how they um, engage with technology. Because I feel that how as integrated as a technology becomes into our daily lives, it's very difficult to create a sense of, 
of autonomy to be able to think of as an autonomous person as to what you know what choices we have about how we engage with technology and i think that might be the starting point of how we imagine ethics while juxtaposing it to the idea that we are completely interconnected and um, and that there are subtle and not so subtle ways that technology is, is, is influencing our lives. And so trying to maintain a sense of um, autonomy as a source of where we can start when we're talking about ethics, I think is, um, is, is, is where we're at with, with a lot of this. <laughs> Thanks, Andrine. Uh, it's a great question. So how do you integrate thinking about risk into your teaching uh, for technologists? And I work with uh, undergraduate students. So I should say I'm not a technologist. I'm, I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm sort of a humanities person who's wandered into the engineering school and, and, and working with computer scientists. And uh, what I try to do is to identify risk as not sort of an add-on that comes on later that you have to worry about the social impact um, after you've already done building your cool new tool. Uh, that's exactly the wrong way to go about it, right? You have to think about uh, what you're doing, how you're creating a technology, what goes into that process, uh, what is effective, how do you measure effectiveness? And, and my colleague, Ruha Benjamin, of course, is sort of a leader in thinking about this, but um, there is a way in which you can have students um, really wrestle with what is the impact of my technology? How do I make sure that it is not um, impacting people in a way that I do not anticipate it doing that? And to, even for them to start asking those questions and not to think about what's the cheapest, most efficient algorithm to solve a problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's asking those deeper questions first and to connect it to ultimately the project, right? So it isn't as a saying, it wasn't an add-on. So it isn't that your algorithm is now made worse because you now have to be fair, <laughs> which is often how these trade-offs are posed. Like, oh, how do you make it fairer? Well, that's you know after we've done making it brilliant. Uh, but in fact, your algorithm is improved and, and serves the needs better if you start from the position of how do we make it fair? And so that's the project and, and uh, love, love to talk about it more. Thanks for that. I mean, I think what, I, what I'm really excited about is you've already begun to um, anticipate the question of risk as a part of the design process. And um, one thing that I, and, and Katie, you said, oh, whatever public interest technology ends up being, right? Um, for us, one of the things that I think we often hear in the pit space from students is that they want to apply their technological skills and knowledge to solving social problems. Yet we know that how we define a problem will go a long way to helping us define what we're solving for and how we evaluate success, right? Um, so we've just had this moment where we're talking about what are the impacts, but now I want to think about sort of how do you help your students define problems that are actually within the scope of tech to solve or even to redress? Like what does success look like? Happy to take a response from anyone who feels comfortable going there. Meredith, you look like you're starting. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I will. Uh, I will speak up. Uh, I think that this is really difficult. Uh, this is one of the things that my students struggle with most. Uh, so I come from a computer science background. Um, I was a computer scientist before I became a journalist, um, and I'm very accustomed to the uh, the kind of cycle of okay identify a problem, reduce the problem to the point where you can write code in order to solve it and then call it a day, right? That's the, uh, you know, the lean startup method. That's the move fast and break things ethos that, uh, that we were sold in the, uh, in the 90s through the aughts. And now we're at a point where we understand that that's not enough, uh, but, the uh, the move fast and break things ethos is still out there, um, so it's it's hard to get uh, students who are trained in the humanities and social sciences to uh, use the construction that computer scientists use of okay define the problem okay refactor it narrow it down narrow it down narrow it down. Um, 
I mean, I, honestly, it's not just hard to have humanities and social science students do this. It's hard to get everybody to do this because it's hard, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I have a couple of mechanisms that I use, uh, but I've also found that this, uh, this technique of, okay, state the problem, rewrite the problem, rewrite it a different way, narrow it down, it actually works in writing as well. So like when you're trying to write uh, an opinion piece, for example, you need a really tight, uh, really tight thesis. And if you're trying to pack too much into your thesis, then you're not going to write it as well because it's easier to write about one thing than it is to write about two things. So it's, it's kind of a general problem solving strategy, right? Define the problem and narrow it down so that it's a problem that you can make a difference about in a reasonable period of time. Uh, I think that people who, uh, who want to solve problems through technology and want to solve, to kind of make the world better through technology, uh, I absolutely welcome that urge. Uh, I have a lot of that urge in me as well. Um, and I think it's, it's important to, uh, to take that urge and also be realistic about it, to kind of say, okay, what are the metrics for success? Uh, what is the more holistic view of success? What is it gonna look like? Uh, and how long is it gonna take to do this project? And scale it back to what you can actually achieve and get a win at in a reasonable period of time. I wanna go um, drill down a little bit deeper for a concrete project. So Meher, talk, us a, talk to us a little bit about the internships that some of your undergraduate students are doing um, at Consumer Financial Protection Bureaus, New York City Office of Chief Technologist, because I think that is an opportunity for us to translate some of these questions in real time so that we can do what Mona says, which is make it a part of students' lived experiences. Yeah, no, this is a great program uh, that, that's part of the PIT system where we have students supply from different undergraduate institutions uh, to come spend a summer working on these issues with government agencies. and. Uh, so last year we had uh, students at the CFPB in the mayor's office and uh, working with the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and what this does is sort of make the problems concrete, right? So one way to do it is to sort of have somebody tell you in a classroom what it's like, but it's quite a bit different to see it out in the real world, to say, okay, I've now got it CFPB, I'm evaluating an algorithm, I have to evaluate if it has a certain disparate impact. What are the tools and techniques that are available? What am I able to see? What am I not able to see? How do I uh, think also as a technologist for us, it's also part of creating a career pathway so that those of you who are who are listening, who are in government institutions can recognize that, you know, hiring technologists, people with a technology background, uh, they can actually add a lot of value to your work because they see the problems in the way that Mary that just described, they have a different approach, a different problem solving approach, and that's something that you can harness. So it's kind of a mix of trying to bring those two elements together, of having the government agency recognize the value of this different way of thinking. And then for the people who come from a pure technologist background to understand, here's how government works. There's a lot of moving parts. It's not like tomorrow you can get something done, but you start addressing a problem together and just the act of doing that, I think, is enormously influential for the students because they feel like, hey, these are things we can actually take on. We can work on uh, the responses to COVID. We can work on these different projects. And I think that's been very helpful for them. And Katie, um, talk, talk to us a little bit about sort of your approach with high school students, because I think a big part of this mix um, for you has been the emphasis on being place-based and engage in the community in this process, which I think Meredith hinted at. And I wanna come back to Mona and talk to her about a project that I know that she's been doing with um, a, a library system. So talk to us about what do you mean in, um, for place-based work and how, the, how does the community contribute to that process? Yeah, so I was glad that Meredith mentioned humanities and social sciences because one <laughs> of the things that I failed, neglected to mention is that the students that i um, recruiting into our program are those that would be choosing um, humanities and social science pathways that aren't looking for a traditional computer science um, degree. And, uh, and so we are trying to create this new way of approaching the study of technology to include voices that are 
um, more based in the humanities and social sciences. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, like our extension of our campus is located on the North Shore, the four high area high schools are, are within, um, can the students that live in the neighborhoods can readily access our, our place. And so we are very place based. And, um, and so the role that technology is playing in and emphasizing technology in the work that we're doing really comes out of um, the, uh, an embedded lived experience of each student and um, how, you know, I, I think there is this bit of a ten tension uh, as that we're always talking about, which is this sort of gatekeeping of sorts that happens between how, how do you access that level of, of um, of development, of impact, of you know growth in terms of the traditional you know uh, tech companies and tech fields, and while also holding on to societal impact questions or community impact questions, and you know we've seen recently that you know in order for what we're doing to really have impact, those people who are sort of harnessing the power um, of this in terms of the, you know, the, comp the major companies that are developers around technology have to be open to really seeing um, and hearing the stories of those who are most impacted by uh, the advancement of their technologies. And it kind of relates to the whole notion of open data um, in the fact that, um, you know, we want the people essentially <laughs> to have access to the tools and to the technology so that their presence is made known right to those who are to the decision makers to the policy makers to those who are making um you know uh decisions that will impact their lives without them being a part of it so not only is our work uh place-based but it's very participatory and 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 sort of taking a strength-based empowerment model where we want to help the students cultivate their identities as, as even if they haven't main, um, been able to pursue traditional pathways into computer science, that they can still have the potential to develop marketable tech skills that can help them gain access to these um, you know, venues that seem often closed off to them, um, invisible to them, um, that don't include them. Uh, Mona, can you talk to us a bit about the work that you've done with the Queens Public Library and how does that relate to the intersection of um, public data, maybe ethics and bias at the same time? Um, and I'd also love, love Meredith for you to think of maybe a concrete project that you're currently working on, because I'd love to, I also love to see how this plays out in real time. Mona? <laughs> Sure, thank you. So um, the project that we're doing with the NYU Center for Responsible AI at Tandon um, with Queens Public Library um, and um, an organization called P2PU, which does uh, learning circles, um, is exactly that. Um, we're creating a, a course called We Are AI, which is going to be a learning circle um, that gets sort of um, distributed first through Queen's Public Library and then is available subsequently um, globally, really, um, where people get together and learn among themselves, for themselves, um, about how these kinds of systems work, what are the social implications, um, and I kind of really don't like the implication part, uh, as Mihir has said, it's kind of, you know, they are always there. It's not that they, the impact happens later. Uh, the politics are always there. Um, and sort of um, get together and think through what it means for their own lived experience so that they can build um, literacy capacity to make demands on local policymakers. Um, and what I want to say in terms of locality, and I'm so glad this came up, is that we, um, the development as it is happening. And um, this project is led by Eric Corbett and Julia Stojanovic and it's, it's been very focused on what are also the local sort of issues in Queens. Like what, you know, what does it mean actually to work with Queens Public Library on this as opposed to, you know, a library in Boston or somewhere else. Um, and uh, that has very much informed how we thought about um, doing this. And I will say that the um, collaboration between social scientists, you know, people from the humanities, technologists, policymakers, that always sounds so easy. But when you actually come together in a room and you have to make something, those are not always easy conversations. And 
you know, for a multitude of reasons, one of them being we have different kinds of incentives and different kinds of languages. And I think um, what's helpful and what has helped with course development, which was or is such a uh, interdisciplinary project is thinking through particular cases or really thorny questions and you know find out how we can talk to one another without like polarizing right we are pulled into this one direction or the other all the time and that that was really hard work um but it was grounding to do this with a view for what it means to do this here in new york city i appreciate that i appreciate that because i that's a part of kind of how we talk about public interest technology is the intersection of all of these disciplines coming together. But I do know that translation and that conversation is really difficult. So actually seeing it in practice is helpful to hear about. Meredith, can you talk a little bit about some of the, maybe some pro projects in practice and how you've been applying some of the things that we we're talking about today? Sure, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the, uh, Pit UN project that I'm working on. Uh, so it is the in NYU Institute for Public Interest Technology. Uh, I'm working with Anne Washington uh, in order to develop a, a training program, a two week training program for early and mid career uh, researchers in order to train them in doing public interest technology and also uh, spreading the uh, spreading the word about the importance of public interest technology to their own students. Um, now, when we uh, when we talk about uh, early and mid career researchers, it's very interesting to specify. Okay, are we talking about teaching the social science stuff to the people who already do the tech, or are we talking about teaching the tech stuff to the people who already do the social science? Uh, because you approach that in very different ways. Right. Uh, so one of the things we're doing with IPIT is uh, we are primarily speaking to social science researchers and we are getting them up to speed on tech skills first and then integrating uh, everything they've learned about technology into uh, the more social science friendly conversations around ethics, around policy, around, OK, what are you trying to do and how uh, can you achieve it? And then finally, how do you take all of this amazing learning and then wrap it into the curriculum that you're creating for your students so that we can help work on a new generation of public interest technologists? Thanks for that. And I, I know, Meher, that you teach a course on big data. And, um, and because this is NYC Open Data Week and this is why we're here, and we know that NYC Data publishes about 3,000 data sets by different city agencies, free to anyone to use. I'm curious about how do you um, how do you talk about uh, how do you talk about big data sets with students? How do you have them think through um, both its utility and then also its limitations? Um, because I think that that's something that Mona and Meredith have gotten um, have gotten across already that this is really difficult work to translate um, in a classroom setting and to make it very clear that there are going to be limitations to how you're solving problems and what those problems are. So I'm curious about that, that, that application. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's not easy uh, <laughs> I like that. Uh, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think there are two strands uh, of thinking. One, I think, is to emphasize uh, how important it is to have open data and how valuable it is for citizens' oversight of government practices. Um, and I think that we we it's a real benefit, and and that that I know my uh, uh, Ed Felton, who is the founder of of CITP, uh, did some very early work to make sure that when data was released, that we had the same standard to release the data, so that it was actually usable by the public. That it wasn't that you had three thousand different ways of uh, displaying the same amount of information. So I, I want to make sure that we keep in the conversation. Um, the power of big data as a lens for the public and, and for people within government agencies to hold themselves accountable. Uh, and at the same time, you're right <laughs> that, that the big data, uh, especially through the government agencies, can, can be used to turn a lens on the public and can be used to reinforce existing biases. And uh, you have to demonstrate that through examples, through lessons, through uh, case studies is sort of maybe as my background as a lawyer is to think about it in terms of case studies, to look at one particular problem to say, okay, if you had this problem where you had to release sensitive data, 
how would you think about it? What the identification techniques are you thinking about? Um, are you really thinking through the best way in which to both preserve the public good of releasing data about your work at the same time, um, not putting at risk the, the individual information uh, uh, for your citizens? And, and I should say that the, the trade-offs are not, um, it's not an either or. There are, there are mechanisms to address both. There are ways to hold people accountable and collect the data. But it, that does take work, and, and it takes a lot of collaborations of the kind that, that Mona and Meredith have been talking about. Um, Meredith, in your book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World, um, you talk about the principle of unreasonable effectiveness of data and its seductiveness. Can you talk us through that principle and its importance to our current conversation? <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad you asked about this because this is one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite concepts. Uh, so the unreasonable effectiveness of big data uh, is the idea that uh, we don't really know how AI is working, but it works really well. Okay, so when you have big data, like when you have millions and millions and millions of data points, uh, you can use uh, very sophisticated modeling tools and you feed in all of this data and you can predict with shocking accuracy things like where somebody is going to click next on a web page or what somebody is going to want to order along with the tortilla chips that they've just put into their uh, into their online grocery cart right so it's it's really seductive the idea that okay the more data we get the better our predictions can be. And many people have taken this to uh, an extreme and they make claims that, okay, everything is going to be known soon and we're going to be able to predict everything. And in the future, nothing will be unknown because we'll have so much data. And it's not at all true. Like, you can predict pretty easy things like, you know, grocery shopping. Like, yes, people probably want to buy salsa with their tortilla chips. Like, that's, it's hardly groundbreaking, but it's amazing that you can predict that with a computer. It's really cool. Uh, so we need to be sure not to get carried away by uh, how fun it is to predict things using data. Um, so one of the things that I think is important in, uh, in terms of public interest technology is realizing the limits of what we can do with computers. Uh, which brings us back to the issue of bias. When people think that computers are omnipotent, when people imagine that we're just on the brink of a digital utopia where everything is gonna be computerized and uh, it's all gonna be sunshine and unicorns, that's when they stop recognizing bias. And we really need to push back against that kind of thinking because no technology is perfect because people are imperfect. Other panelists, any reflection on based on what Meredith said, Katie? Yeah, as, as I'm so excited to be a part of this panel. So thank you, uh, New America. Um, you know, as everyone was talking, you know, one of the things that keeps coming up is sort of where I started before, which is how do you imagine the individual um, stance in terms of how we receive or critique or have a critical view to the integration of technology in our lives and then where where is the position within the the, the developers um and the big tech companies around that pushback right so of course if there's like organized you know public boycotts of certain products because of the public becomes aware of, of its impact in a negative way, you know, there, that could have an influence in pushing the envelope, but, but that feels way more um, punitive than I think these ethical questions need to be. So like, how do we create spaces within the business of technology to allow for there to be more of a moral stance or an ethical stance on the impact of technology on societies? I know there's some other cultures in the world that are a little bit better at doing this than we are, but like, what, does, what would that require? And, and I think, you know, how disruptive the notion of open data has been in terms of who owns data 
you know, who owns the impact, like who owns the consequence, like this level of transparency has to also have built in a, a notion of, of accountability. And then how do we close that loop? Like how, how do we, you know, ensure that if bias is revealed or if negative impact is revealed that there's some follow through, right? Does it require government intervention? Does it require, uh, um, uh, you know, like uh, independent monitoring? You know, I, I would love to explore that further. <laughs> I would as well. The, um, go ahead, Mona. I just want to piggyback onto that and sort of um, kind of ask, you know, how do we also distribute sort of the notion of literacy and learning? Because we have, you know, my students are, I, they delight and surprise me every day. They are so ready for these kinds of questions. They do, you know, incredible research projects. They are, and Andrea and I, you know, we've talked about this. They're really ready to go into organizations and do this kind of work. We have um, an increasingly educated public. We also have policymakers who are now sort of getting really into the weeds of what it means to think, you know, concretely about these thorny questions, but then we also have kind of a corporate side where some of these questions are not addressed or they're suppressed or they are, um, you know, kind of pushed aside or siloed uh, into, you know, different kinds of areas, whilst we also know that these organizations are, you know, very diverse in and of themselves. So I wonder um, how we can actually get to a place where we can have this conversation with these powerful organizations in a way that is sort of oriented towards opening up the PIT framework. Uh, and, and, and again, that starts with thinking about what are the different kinds of roles that um, are open. And I just wanna point to a piece of research that I think is really important here, which is the um, work that Jake Metcalf and Emmanuel Moss at Data and Society are doing on ethics owners, where they did empirical research on what are the kinds of roles um, in organizations that look at ethics, that address, you know, that have to work with these kind of um, thorny questions. And I think um, getting everybody at a table is really important here and also push organizations a little bit, which is something that we want to do with a, with our PIT project where we will host a, a big career fair and convention and kind of bring in organizations as well to get them uh, to understand that um, you know, recruiting means not just recruiting technologists who then sort of do a little bit of social science, but really the whole breadth of the capabilities that students now bring because they want to. I want to pull Meher in here because Meher, I would love to um, hear what you think about the sort of policy side of this, because I think traditionally that's been the space that's left to say, you have to tackle the ethical dimensions of this labor, right? Um, and, then I, and then I also want to come back to sort of how do you all break down kind of the ethical um, framework within your teachings of students? How do you get them to a place where they feel comfortable trying to respond to the question of like the sense of a collective good and, and really digging into that? But Mayor? <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know, the, as you're right, Andre, you know, the policy world is slowly coming along um, to recognizing these issues. Uh, but I think, and, and perhaps this is helpful for all of us, is that the Policy world tends to think in very concrete terms about the human stories and the, the effects on their constituents and, and some sort of narrative that connects up what would be a harm from an algorithmic system being, say, using data in some way that we don't want it to be used and the effect on, on the citizens. And so I, I think um, I think it behooves sort of us as researchers and academics and other people in the space that sometimes we talk about people being at the table. And that's certainly something the policymakers can understand. But then their minds are thinking about, well, what's next, right? Now everyone's at the table, now what do we do? Uh, what's, how do we think through what are different ways of organizing this? How do I decide if a particular piece of software is biased or not biased? How do I make that determination? What will you tell me as a consumer of ethical, you know, what is ethical, what is not, what should I be looking for? So that's an area I think for us to, it's a challenge for us. And I think it's uh, because these are not easy questions to answer. These are hard questions as Meredith was saying. These are not ones in which we necessarily have consensus on what the answers are. But um, I think that's the next step for us is to engage more concretely with specific problems and present them to policymakers to say, 
here's the issues, here's where it's going wrong, and here are things we can do to address it. Yeah, and so um, I see a nod from Meredith. Um, one thing I, I wanted to just place this within the context of something that you mentioned in your book, Meredith, which is like there should be a distinction made between what's popular and what is good, right? Um, and, and that in some sense, even the very design or the DNA of computer systems and tech culture is built off of that constraint, right? The popularity of a thing is what lets it rise to the top. So I'm curious, how do you all try to operationalize thinking around the ethical constraints and, um, and, how, and how, to, how it can be applied practically um, for your students? How do you sort of make that um, case come more alive for your students in the classroom setting? And then hopefully, um, how, hopefully how they take it to their particular careers. Well, the idea of uh, the difference between the popular and the good uh, is an easy sell for college students uh, because they have just been through the rigor of high school. Uh, and in high school, uh, if you are not a popular kid, you <laughs> understand that there is a lot that is not popular, but is still you know, really important and valid and good in the world. Uh, one of the ways that social media systems are constructed is uh, they, uh, they promote the popular as a proxy for good because computers can't autonomously determine what is good. Right? That is something that only a person can do. Uh, so once you start talking about it in these very concrete terms and you realize that you can't write an algorithm that determines what is good, you have to use proxies, uh, then it's a way of getting at, okay, what are the other proxies that we're using? Uh, one of the deeply unglamorous things that we do in public interest technology is we read the documentation. Uh, it, it sounds so silly and it <laughs> sounds so simple, but nobody ever does it. So <laughs> you start with reading, what did the system designers say that they were doing in this system? And it's usually written down like in black and white, what they were trying to do and what are the proxies that they're using? And then that's a really good starting place for saying, okay, does this work or does this not work? Um, Meher and um, Mona, any any reflections on that? I think I think I see your hand up, Mona. Yeah, I just want to second that because um, from sort of two angles. One is that um, we're going we can expect new regulations in in Europe dropping uh, in about April that will actually take sort of more of a case study approach and really you know focus on different cases even within. Um, sectors and industries, so we will see different sort of considerations around, you know, different kinds of applications within a sector such as healthcare. Uh, so I think it's very important that we um, are mindful of what's sort of happening, how regulators are thinking about this, and how this will also signal across um, the pond, um, as it were. And so that then means that we will actually probably have to cultivate more of a practice of documentation. And I think moving forward, I mean, we might want to look to um, you know, library sciences mm -hmm. and historians who have dealt with these um, questions and issues for a very long time. And I would hope that in addition to, you know, thinking about ethics in terms of um, philosophy or ethics in terms of the law and justice, we might also want to include these kinds of considerations into our curricula and uh, with an anticipation of what is going on and, and sort of also getting students to a point where they are comfortable doing that. One of the ways in which I do that in my class is like they do their own research project and they have to go through the very painful process of, um, you know, identifying an interest, scoping it out, articulating research questions and really documenting their own work. Um, but they end up with very solid um, pieces. And I think that's just good practice. And we might want to think about how we can cultivate that moving forward. Katie, um, did I see that you? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, I um, yeah, I mean, I also, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about and talking with my students about too is that the hidden ways in which, um, even with um, open data, that we may render certain communities vulnerable in an effort to do good. And so those kind of weird sort of 
um, ways in which we might have the good, the, the goodest, I don't know where my, <laughs> <laughs> the best intentions, mm -hmm. um, but then also do harm, right? So, so in terms of like, who, who do we get data from? Um, it's usually those with whom we have ready access to, and those tend to also be people who have, you know, various degrees of vulnerability and, and also who have a certain degree of publicness to their lives. And so, you know, just being careful and having my students be mindful of, you know, even, and even though my students are, you know, you know, living and are coming from those contexts, um, you know, in their real push to do good, you know, the unintentional harms that we might face with, you know, the vulnerabilities that data can, um, having access to data can provide. And then, you know, how do we look up? Like, how do we also require those who seem untouchable or inaccessible or privileged in some way that they're not so readily studied or readily accessed in terms of their um, comings and goings in their lives, you know, like, how do we take a look up to kind of make, um, what kind of information we have more equitable across all dimensions of our society, not just maybe in the under-resourced areas or in, you know, um, you know, areas that are historically targeted for surveillance. That's a really good point because I think um, to Meher's point earlier that it's really vital that we have access to public data, but this question of who's in the public data right now, who's easily accessible via public data, do you, can you all speak to who you think is sort of missing in that space and what that means? What, what are we extrapolating from these data sets then? What's the picture of the world that's kind of emerging? Um, Meher? I thought you were about to start, but uh, I'll just I'll just give one anecdote, and then I'd love to hear what Meredith has to say. Is just um, you know, in New York City, right? The police department just recently released complaint data about police officers, and that's an example of effective, in my view, effective open data uh, to promote accountability and to promote abilities for outside researchers to probe questions about bias and police practices. And it's uncomfortable. It's not necessarily that easy for police officers. I'll give one other quick anecdote. There was a, a, a sociologist, uh, Sarah Brain, who, who studied the LAPD police department, and she's written a book about it. It's a great book. It just came out. And she has this ex example of sort of doing the ride along with a police officer, and uh, the police officer keys in his location to send it back to headquarters. And she says, well, why are you keying it in? Is don't you have a sophisticated way of telling where you are? You say, yes, we do, but we turned it off. The union mandated that we turn off that data collection uh, to protect the police officer. So you see that kind of issue playing out where the powerful don't like the data to be collected about themselves and don't want to be held accountable. And I think there's an opportunity here to use data to hold people accountable, like I was saying before. That's a great point, Meredith. <laughs> Uh, so I think one of the best examples of uh, figuring out who is and isn't in the data is Joy Bolanwini uh, has a project called Gender Shades uh, that she did with Timnit Gebru and Deb Raji. And the Gender Shades project uh, was primarily about facial recognition. Uh, they discovered that facial recognition systems are better at recognizing light skin than dark skin. They're better at recognizing men than women, and they don't at all uh, recognize trans or non-binary folks. Uh, and this is a problem. And some people look at this uh, project and say, all right, well, the answer is let's make the data sets more diverse. Let's put more people of different skin tones into the training data, and then the facial recognition systems will be better. And that's not the answer uh, because facial recognition systems are disproportionately weaponized against vulnerable communities, against communities of color. So the answer is let's not use facial recognition and let's especially not use facial recognition in policing, right? So it's not really about changing the technology, it's about should we be using the technology at all? Uh, and I am delighted to say in the wake of this project, uh, several cities have uh, abolished the use of facial recognition in policing, which is terrific. Uh, so I would also call attention to a project by AI Now, 
um, where they are collecting data sets that have been used to train AI models, very popular AI models. Uh, and uh, by collecting these data sets, you can uh, look at the data and see who is and isn't in this data, which gives you a clue about you know, who's uh, being left out of the decision making. Um, and in terms of uh, just general uh, investigating algorithms, I think it's important to call attention to the work of the markup uh, led by Julia Engwin. Uh, her project Machine Bias for ProPublica really kicked off our entire conversation about uh, fairness in algorithms. And the markup is just doing exceptional work of investigating algorithms, holding uh, decision makers accountable and building new technology in order to uh, get more insights into the technologies we use every day. Uh, Katie? And uh, before before you go, Katie, I just want to um, say that in about seven minutes or so, we're going to open it up for questions from our audience. So please do use the Q&A feature in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear from you, love to um, offer up resources as well. Um, that's probably going to be my final question to the group. You've already begun to do that, which is sort of what are some of the projects and organizations that are advancing a thoughtful approach to bias and ethics? What do you believe are some of those essential features of their work that um, that makes them valuable? But Katie, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mer what Meredith was just saying um, was just made me also think about um, how we could enter um, the conversation around when um, private companies partner with public agencies um, to who then may have this desire to weaponize, you know, seemingly benign technology or, you know, beneficial technology for purposes that may not be so, that may have unfair impacts on especially community, poor communities of color. And so, and that even, so, and even, and again, I don't want to speak out of turn um, in terms of um, naming certain companies or whatever. Um, but, you know, some say, for instance, um, a company can develop some technology that was supposed to aim at, you know, um, stopping child sex trafficking um, that can then be snowballed or utilized or bought by local police agencies to actually target and um, harass um, sex workers, right? And so, so there's ways in which like we should probably also have some kind of stance or talk about the ways in which what to what degree should public agencies partner with private companies, um, you know, in order to sort of exploit their product or exploit the data that they collect, you know, there's, you know, something locally happening with the technology that sort of combs Facebook for photos and things to then match them up with mug shots. And so, you know, like, where that role that plays in terms of the ethics, I think is important for us to, to have some kind of accountability or knowing whether or not these private public partnerships are occurring. I think that's really valuable. And one of the things I thought that's, I think that's been interesting to see emerging is this decision to not continue down a particular road. And, um, and that question that brings up the issue to me of sort of the de design process and where does, where do we insert that piece in the design process. Uh, how do you all see that um, as a potential um, roadmap for how we tackle these ethical questions? And where are those uh, those off ramps? Is this like the Frankenstein question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, you know, to Meher's point earlier, where he said you don't, you're not building something and then going, oh, well, I, now I'm noticing. So if you're beginning to, I mean, and I think there are a couple of themes that have emerged from this conversation thus far, which is like, if you presume bias, then how are you doing your labor within this space? And then what are those um, on and off ramps if you are presuming bias? Because the way it has been, at least how you perceive it publicly is that, oh no, we've created this new thing that's done this very bad thing we didn't anticipate. But now I, I do believe that we see folks who are saying that you can have that conversation and begin to have that um, dialogue about um, its impact as early as possible within the process. Um, and so I'm curious of you, for you all to sort of speak to that and where you see that working fairly well 
um, and, um, and, and what you think that might mean for how we proceed down this road in the future. Yeah, I mean, if I can just jump in real quick, um, I think that if companies in development encourage these conversations from the very beginning, that it has a potential to, you know, have the kind of impact that I think we're talking about, but the companies themselves need to be ready for these decision points, right? That if those decision points come, that a, a decision will be made. So, so some maybe early like setup work around, you know, if we face with this, what will be our decision? Um, and they should stick to it and not then maybe fire the person that's like bringing that certain thing to light. Um, you know, again, I, I can't share, but publicly, but I've faced that personally um, in a project that I was working on that, you know, once certain things come to light, then I was no longer a part of the team. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and I had no recourse to then, you know, inter intervene in that way. So with that decision, so sort of building, you know, uh, so maybe going through some like um, possible scenarios and some exercises to kind of ready the company for a true commitment to this work in an ethical way might be a starting point. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Mona, and then Meher. Okay. Um, just really quickly, I'm going to be the grumpy social scientist just for a second. Please, whereby, please, um, please. <laughs> I find, and I really appreciate the Frankenstein <laughs> question, <laughs> there, Katie, because I find this incredibly hard to answer. Um, if we look at sort of the structural issues that we're facing, and they're they're really like that are really surfacing now, that are thankfully in you know right in the middle of our conversations, uh, particularly when it comes to bringing in people into uh, design, whether that's through participatory design methods, co-design, public engagement, literacy, however you want to call it. Um, the problem is what are the conditions under which this happens? What are the structural conditions under which this happens? Yeah. And um, you know, last year I, I wrote a little piece with um, a few other folks about what I think is a real problem, which is that participation very often is extractive by nature because we are in, in an extractive social system. And so if we don't provide more equity when it comes to resource distribution, healthcare, childcare, like all these things, then we can't even begin to sincerely think about what it means to make these socio-technical systems and these interfaces between the public, the technology, corporations, public institutions, more equitable. So we need to have these conversations alongside conversations about technology. And we need to be mindful of the fact that we can't be, you know, be bogged down by a conversation about, oh, how can we help, you know, make this technology better uh, when, when there's no structural change. There's a real opportunity um, to have these conversations now. And we're, we're seeing development here um, in the US. And what I just wanna add to sort of close that off is I think there is a real opportunity also to engage locally with these kinds of questions. For example, here in New York City, mm -hmm. we have the City Council Committee on Technology. There are public hearings, there is reporting on that, there's local advocacy groups. Universities are involved, different kinds of, you know, artists are involved. There is something going on and that's not just in New York. So I would generally say that there, you know, you, you can do this locally, engage locally to push for this structural change. There are a number of undergraduate students and graduate students who I work with, and I'm sure all of you on the panel have experienced this, where they really understand this problem and they want to be at the front lines of addressing it. And really, this is an opportunity for uh, the folks who do the hiring to think about getting more of these students in your folds, to, to give them opportunities, to ask them what they've learned, to learn about their perspectives, because uh, we're really at a generational shift here. I think where uh, the the next generation of students coming through understand uh, very well the implications of these technologies and how to think about that and want to work in addressing them. And so I would encourage you to sort of think about that as a resource to look to your students for ideas um, and, and your new hires to think about them as, as a real resource here. Uh, thanks for that point. And I want to just throw this quickly to Mona before I go to a couple questions from the, um, the Q&A session. Mona, you've talked about a couple of um, that, that you're working on an upcoming career fair. 
And one thing that you want to be sure to include in that career fair are these roles that you think uh, could be expanded. Um, could you talk a little bit about that in terms of what you're thinking and so folks can begin to see a, a bit of a roadmap? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, just a disclaimer, it's kind of early days. Yep, this early will days. be put on um, will be put on in the fall of this mm -hmm. year. So um, what we're doing now is we are starting to have conversations with companies, but also with um, other potential collaborators within the uh, Pit UN network to um, just understand how they think about pit potential pit roles at this point and how we can work with them to showcase these roles um in you know during the event so in in different kinds of ways so um for example through a case study workshop or a range of case study workshops that we'll be hosting but also just like through showcasing people who occupy these ethics owners of pit pit of roles within uh these organizations at the moment and the diversity of them but also really showcasing the work that students are doing already in these courses across the universities um, that are case study focused that are really um really really high quality bringing together sort of the company you know macro considerations with micro uh, considerations and and center that in different kinds of ways for example through a competition and so the thing with that is that sort of relationship building right and having conversations because there is of course the template of a career fair which is very recruiting focused especially in the tech industry and we kind of need to disentangle that a little bit um mm -hmm. we have a partner we're partnering with all tech is human uh, on that and uh, who are already doing work in that space and so it's sort of a mutually uh a, you know a process that um educates both sides we hope mm -hmm. and so the actual project you know it's not just the fair it's kind of building that conversation. Well, you're creating a community, which is what we really want to be conceived of in this space. Uh, so a couple of questions from our participants. And again, please continue to share those questions in the Q&A and um, in the chat. Uh, would you say coming from so a social science background is a benefit or barrier to data science? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> uh, I can take that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, you can start anywhere and get into data science. Mm -hmm. uh, it just requires commitment. Um, it's not easy. I think that one of the uh, one of the mistakes people make is they imagine that all technology is the same. That uh, because you know you're because you really like using Instagram, you're going to want to be a data scientist, and they're really different. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that said, uh, data science is is hard, but it's not impossible, and you absolutely should feel like you're qualified to do it, no matter what your background is. And this other question: the challenge with more with more data, we the user allows services to obtain, the more opportunities for that data to be used in unethical ways. I think that's just an observation. Um, when is the answer to creating a new data driven product? No whether for ethical or lack of data reasons? And how do you teach students and create incentives slash protections for them to say no when it will have implications for their careers? These are some of the structural issues that I think Mona was sort of getting at, right? Go ahead, Mona. I just want to point to another resource uh, by AI now who have put out a guide how to interview a tech company. So they um, have a you know a little put together a little piece where um, they help students wrap their head around how this particular organization works culturally and what kinds of questions and they need to ask in order to find um, answers to that those questions. Um, I think generally. Um, it, that question should at least be able to be on the table, you know, uh, uh, at the very least. And I think that is a political project very much. Um, and I think we're kind of in the middle of that right now. So there's no easy answer, I think. That's fair. Um, Katie? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we all we all fall into the the um, issue with with like that hindsight is twenty twenty. So like usually after the problem happens, we can all say, oh, why didn't they see it coming? You know, like the seeing it coming is usually the the hardest part. And so I don't think a no is very easy. Nor sh maybe it shouldn't be a no. Maybe it should be yes. 
end, you know, like a gingerly along a path, especially, I mean, again, depending on what your goals are of your project, um, you know, tr you know, in tr and maybe building in checkpoints, you know, so there's a, sen a sense of reflection and, and also, and perhaps even um, an impartial party being able to sort of give some insight into the progress of the development of a project. Um, because I, I don't think any of these issues are very, very clear cut, which is why they're so ripe for um, moral and ethical investigation, because there is no clear yes and there is no clear no. And every yes could also be a no and every no could maybe have some yes in it, right? So again, there's always that, um, you know, sort of risk versus benefit ratio that has to be negotiated, I think, at every step. But as Mona said, I think at some point, someone or or it sh there should be some ability for there to be a way to intervene and say no. Um, Meredith, this might be a question that you can add some value to here. Where and how does management play in into ensuring computer programs, operations, and or policies are ethical, especially in, especially in areas such as social media versus journalism media. Hmm. What role does management play? Mm -hmm. uh, management is everything. Mm -hmm. uh, management determines the direction of a project. Uh, management says, go ahead, even when, uh, you know, when or if concerns are surfaced. Um, there is another thing at work uh, that is very important to note, which is a feature of group dynamics. Um, when you are in a group and you're talking about, you know, say developing a new algorithm, uh, nobody wants to be the person who says, hey, I think this has the potential to be racist. Nobody wants to be the person who says, hey, this excludes trans folk. Uh, People want to get along in groups. Uh, people want to keep their jobs. People don't want to be perceived as the, uh, you know, as the one who stirs the pot. Uh, so we just have to be aware of this, and managers should be conscious of this group dynamic and make it safe to speak up. Uh, there is uh, a lot going on at Google right now um, mm -hmm. that I points to poor management. Mm -hmm. uh, managers, uh, for example, would have employees coming to them complaining of racism uh, or you know, talking about uh, incidents of racism that they have experienced. And then they would be, uh, the managers or the HR people at Google would respond with giving them mental health resources. And you don't need mental health resources when you're going to HR about having experienced racism at work, you need HR to address it. Uh, you need, uh, you know, you need remedies. Like, I mean, therapy is great, but it's not actually going to fix the problem of your coworker being racist. Um, Katie. Yeah, I mean, just as we deal with in higher ed also, like mm -hmm. a workplace culture um, could be totally different than setting the impact of what you're developing, right? So you could adopt, you know, really um, equitable, like cool, like, you know, healthy workplace environments and still make a tool that, you know, does some harm to vulnerable communities. And I think that also can be a hard thing for a lot of, um, you know, companies to deal with, like as Meredith was saying, like nobody wants to be the one to speak up and be like, oh, I think this this might be racist or this might be transphobic. You know, you also could think you're really, you have a lot of strengths on the interpersonal like work culture building piece of it, but then miss a lot <laughs> in terms of like the impact of what you're developing. Um, and then, you know, one thing that we didn't mention, especially for tech startups, is that the amount of, of stress that is incurred when you have like angel investors and like people who are flooding, you know, your your idea with a lot of money. Um, it, it may be hard to stop that and say, you know what, we had to stop because of, you know, we saw the potential of this going wrong. And so um, allowing for there to be ways in which people can manage the stress of doing the quote unquote right thing, I think is something also that is beyond just 
how do you how do you deal with microaggressions or macroaggressions in the workplace? Um, well, I mean, I think one of the things that's emerging here, and you all have hinted at it, is that there there are there needs to be a sort of a larger structural systemic approach to dealing with these issues that are not left to the individual alone, right? And so I have noticed that there are some emerging things around um, papers being submitted at conferences and how do you um, tackle, how do you make sure that a paper that's been submitted hasn't been um, reviewed by a lawyer? Um, so are there any sort of signals that you are seeing on a sort of larger scale that um, that you can offer up to the audience as, um, as an approach that you think is sort of worthwhile to um to support or to um to 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 share with the audience right now we've said it in sort of not in non-concrete ways but I, i'd love to hear about some systemic pieces that you think would be valuable and Meher. sure uh, and i'll make a, a plug for a program that i'm, I'm doing uh, yep. as we're doing this um is that we're trying to bring um policy who have a kind of challenging question and do a case study session at cidp uh, where you have computer scientists and social scientists and, and other people uh, examine the question from multiple angles and give you feedback on what are some of the implications. And I think one of the things that this addresses is sort of getting better at the issue that you're raising is that sometimes internally it's hard to make that pitch to your fellow co-workers, what's the problem here? But if you engage with a university audience, which is more... Um, ready to sort of examine it from multiple angles. And you can then at least battle test your idea and see how it's received. And, and it's a, I think a lot of universities want their students to have that experience as well, so that they see how difficult it is to wrestle some, with some of these problems. And so that's certainly something I'm trying to do with the case studies. Uh, and you've seen, you know, people come with their challenges and uh, how do we collect data responsibly? How do we, make uh, certain kinds of decisions. And it's not that we're gonna sort of give you the right answer, but it at least allows for the surfacing of multiple angles and multiple points of view. And that's something then the organization can take away and, and go do something with it. So um, thanks for that, Meher. And someone else, someone has asked this question, um, how older people not understanding technology often don't understand that most young people are end users and consumers. We've tried to communicate that. What is a way, well, how do we effectively educate different um, communities about the impact of technological innovations on those communities when it may not be immediately apparent? What are some good teachable moments for that kind of conversation? Uh, I, can, uh, I can start this one off. Yep. Um, one of the things that I've read about is an idea I call techno chauvinism. Yep. Uh, the idea that technology is superior. Uh, and we, we need to push back against this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to stop imagining that we're going to be able to replace all of our existing systems with technology and it's just going to be all, you know, sunny days ahead. Um, so the COVID vaccine process is a good example of this. Uh, one of the ways, in, at least in New York State, uh, at first you could only sign up for a COVID vaccine online using these incredibly complicated web interfaces. Well, older users were not able to effectively navigate these interfaces. Um, I know that I, you know, I I had to make an appointment for. Uh, my elderly relatives because they simply were not able to navigate these things. And now there is a phone number that you can call and get help as well. But there should have been a phone number from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, they, so you can't just imagine that you're going to take your paper forms and put them on the web and you're going to be able to automate your customer service line. Uh, using technology effectively means using the newest technology and also retaining the older modes of communication uh, for you know when there's a hurricane and the power goes out or for older users or for users who have a range of abilities and are more comfortable with different technologies. Um, so don't imagine that you're going to replace everything with new technology. You're just gonna keep doing more and more and more. Thanks for that, Meredith. Um, Mona? 
Just really quickly to add to that, um, I think for me, this also links back to, uh, you know, resources for communities. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I did last year was run a research project called Terra Incognita, where we examined the emergence of digital public space and community, you know, under conditions of the lockdown um, and, you know, and one of the things that we learned is that communities were incredibly um, good at, you know, providing or it, it, coming up with systems and infrastructures for mutual support. And that was specifically also for uh, elderly members of the community so they could participate in um, worshiping or in other activities. And so what these communities would need is sort of support to do the work that they are already doing as a community and recognizing that as labor. And I think that's a very important policy learning here that, you know, how Meredith described it, the stacking onto, you know, of technologies on top of each other as sort of community driven and maintained infrastructure, I think is a very important notion that we sort of should really be mindful of as we move forward. Thanks. And um, I think I'm going to let Katie, you have the final word before we close out. I, I thank everyone for um, taking the time to pop back in when we had our technical, technical snafu. Uh, go ahead, Katie. Um, you know, we haven't really talked that much about COVID today. And I think it is gonna be interesting to see like if we can imagine what a post COVID world might be. And, and as Maris was saying that, you know, this quickly shift to like connecting virtually, you know, maybe could leave some users behind. But I think there was like an enormous learning curve that was also like, overcome and that might have leveled the playing field a little bit, even though, of course, there's unevenness with access and there's, you know, the how we dealt with COVID really illuminated a lot of the disparities in communities as such. But I also think that there's this enormous potential that now we do, we may have a lot more people that are a bit tech, more tech savvy, but also have an understanding of how integrated technology is in our lives. Thanks for that. Um, I want to thank my panelists for joining us today and for um, helping us sort of navigate this uh, space of public interest technology. You all have been so wonderful and contributory to this process for us. Um, I think what, what, what I wanna communicate right away is that this is an evolving space. It's a process as you see, as you've seen, and as I think our panelists have said, there continue to be evolving questions and challenges that we want talented and engaged folks to participate in helping to define for us. Um, I know Meredith has said this, again, it's not done. This is a process, um, but I wanna thank Meredith Broussard, um, Kathleen Kamitsky, uh, Meher, Sid Scherziger, which I love, I went and pronounced that, and Mona Sloan. Uh, one thing I, I wanna encourage you all um, to do is um, we will be sharing some resources and some follow-up um, contact details um, for all of the participants that registered for this. I know that a lot of, um, there are lots of mentions of different um, projects or different books or different things that um, folks have found really valuable. So I'm going to try to collect those from our panelists as best as I possibly can and um, be able to share that out in an email to all of our participants. Thank you so much again for joining us on this Monday afternoon. Um, again, this is um, Andrine Soli, and I'm the director of the Public Interest Technology University Network. You can find us at newamerica.org. And um, we look forward to continuing to engage you around these um, thorny issues around ethics, tech, and um, bias. Thanks again.